Welcome to our video for high leverage practice number 16, Use Explicit Instruction. The primary sources for content in this video are Anita Archer and Charles Hughes' book, Explicit Instruction, and the High Leverage Practices in Special Education book published by CEC and the Cedar Center. There are 22 high leverage practices for special education spread across four domains. HLP number 16, Use Explicit Instruction falls under the Instruction domain. This video is organized into two parts. First, we introduce and define Explicit Instruction. In Part 2, we break the practice down into four key components to illustrate how general and special education teachers are using Explicit Instruction to support the needs of students with disabilities across a range of settings. Part 1, Introduction to Explicit Instruction. Explicit instruction is one of the most extensively researched instructional approaches available to general and special education teachers working with students with disabilities. But what is it? Explicit instruction is really a set of teacher behaviors that are individually and collectively effective and efficient for supporting student outcomes. Put simply, explicit instruction helps teachers design and deliver effective instruction for a range of student learning needs. Teachers who use explicit instruction bring a laser-like focus on only selecting the most critical content students need to know, sequencing skills logically, and breaking complex skills and strategies into smaller instructional units. Teachers also highlight critical examples and non-examples. One hallmark of explicit instruction is teachers provide lots of opportunities for students to respond to keep instruction moving at a brisk pace and provide immediate feedback on student performance. Language used within explicit lessons is crystal clear. Another hallmark is explicit lessons are known for the I do, we do, you do instructional sequence. This means the teacher first models how to solve a problem or complete a task by thinking aloud and provides a demonstration. Then the teacher guides students through a scaffolded application of the skill or concept and provides feedback. Finally, students are provided opportunities for independent practice to ensure mastery. Students receive meaningful feedback at every step. It's important to note that while any teacher can and should provide explicit instruction, the intensity with which teachers use this practice increases with the specific needs of students with disabilities. For example, special education teachers and other specialists should use data to make informed decisions about the size of instructional groups and determine the needed intensity of instruction. Part 2 four key components of explicit instruction. Although explicit instruction contains numerous aspects, in this video we focus on four key components. The four components are use a logical sequence within lessons, provide clear models and explanations of content, provide multiple opportunities to respond and appropriate feedback on performance, and provide a range of examples and non-examples to highlight content being taught. Component 1. Use a logical sequence within lessons. After choosing the content or what will be taught, explicit instruction shapes how the content will be taught. Teachers should begin lessons with an explicit statement of purpose, 
and provide an advance organizer for the lesson. It's important that teachers be unambiguous in terms of how information is provided. Each word should be carefully chosen. And content should be sequenced in a logical format to go from easiest to understand to most complex. In the following clip from a low incidence disability classroom, Mrs. Raines explicitly tells her student what they're going to work on during the lesson. Note she is also providing opportunities to respond and specific feedback on her behavior and academic performance. What are we going to do today? We're going to read. Hello, Mo. Hello, Mo. Would you like to say good morning to Mo? No. No, you want me to say good morning? Good morning, Mo. All right. Look here. Hello. Hello, Mo. So we said hello to Mo. All righty. So we're going to read Mo likes to uh, sing. Can you have a calm body, please? So look, you have one calm body, and we need two more until we are <laughs> finished. Would you like to do computer? Yeah. OK, so let's start with Mo. Do you want to say hello to Mo now? No. OK, hello, Mo. I'll just say hello to Mo. All right, you have your second calm body. Good job. So we are going to read the story, Mo likes to Oh, Mo likes to sing. All right, can you show me Mo? Where's Mo? There's Mo. In the following clip from a one-on-one -on -one reading lesson, Mrs. Booth provides intensive explicit supports for her student by providing a tightly planned review of known skills and then a logical request to see those skills in action. Please note the use of lots of opportunities to respond, explicit feedback, and an appropriate pace. So this is one of our red words, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you show me how we're going to use our arm and tap on that side where we already know? T-H-E-Z. Let's do it again. T-H-E-Z. So what is this word? Z. Z. Can you show me, using your typing hand, how we can figure out what this word is? Big. Big. Okay, remember to pound it. Do it for me again. Big. Big. Awesome. So what does this say so far? Big. Big. Okay, can you sound this word out for me too? Um... So what's this word? Sun. Can you read the title of that book for me? The Big Sun. The Big Sun. Excellent. I like the way you read that title for me. Component 2. Provide clear models and explanation of content. As noted in Part 1 of this video, explicit instruction should include modeling by the teacher when appropriate. This can occur within the I do or we do phases of explicit instruction. From day to day, the role of modeling in a lesson may change based on the lesson's objective, which can include teaching new content, connecting to previously learned content, and helping students see and hear your thinking about the content being taught, and how you as the teacher solve problems. Once the teacher models, it's the student's turn to have guided and supported practice opportunities with the teacher monitoring performance and systematically fading supports until students have reached mastery. In the following clip, Ms. Samuels is within the we do phase of explicit instruction. She is both modeling her thinking for solving a double digit subtraction problem with regrouping, but also explicitly prompting her students to demonstrate their knowledge. So what's this part that you're going to do first, boys and girls? Solve. Solve. What are you going to do first? Solve. Solve it. And then what are you going to do second? Inverse And that's how you're going to check it. So my first step is to do what? Who remembers what's our little song? Tell us, remember, we're adding and subtracting double digits. 
Addition. 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 Or and we're doing double digit addition. Yes, or subtraction. Start us off, London. Ooh. Line them up and line them up too. Always start in the ones place, dude. Don't forget your sign too. That'll tell you what to do. If you're stuck, push through. Awesome. So I line them up. I label them. I started my ones place, dude. Don't forget my what? Sign. Sign. What's my sign? Minus. Minus sign. Do I have more on the floor here? Yes. Yes, yes. so I need to go next door. Go next door. I can't possibly do one takeaway seven, so I need to go next door and borrow a group of ten. ten. So eight. this nine becomes an eight. Eight. I add my group of ten eleven. over here. One plus ten is eleven. So I'm now looking at eleven minus what? Seven. 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 What is eleven minus seven? Four. The answer is four. What is 8 minus 2? 6. 6. What's my answer? 64. Can I get a quiet hand to go ahead and come up and show me the inverse operation? London. Although in the previous clip, we showed the teacher supporting students within the we do phase of explicit instruction, it is often appropriate for the balance of time to be tilted towards students' independent practice. Component 3. Provide multiple opportunities to respond and appropriate feedback. Explicit instruction should be delivered at a pace that allows students to make the needed connections to boost learning. An instructional pace that's too slow can cause boredom. Too fast and you risk overwhelming students' limited cognitive resources. One way to keep your lesson moving is by delivering a healthy number of opportunities to respond. Students' responses can be verbal, written, or performed. And questions can and should challenge students at varying levels of difficulty tied to a logical instructional sequence. This can mean providing recall or choral prompts or deeper probing questions that require application of skill. The level of your question should depend on the goals of the lesson and capacity of your students. Regardless of the stage of the lesson, teachers must provide students with affirmative or corrective feedback. Feedback is most powerful when it is tied to the performance of the student and is as specific as possible. In other words, do more than say yes or good job. Communicating with students in terms of how they are or are not meeting your expectations and performance level is an essential component of explicit instruction. In this clip, note how Mrs. Khan provides lots of varying opportunities for her student to respond, coupled with immediate and specific feedback, which is used as both a reinforcer and launching point for furthering instruction. Hey Molly, you ready to make your plan for today? Yeah. Okay, so first we're going to have work time. Yeah. And then I'll give you a choice of what you would like to do for number two. So play time. All right, playtime sounds good. And would you like a sticker today also? Yes. How about you add sticker time? And then what will we also do? Clean up time. Yeah, we'll have to clean up the toys that we play with. And then what will be last on our plan? Go back to class. All right, sounds like a good plan. You ready to get started? Yeah. All right. All right, Molly. So last week we learned about our four W's and our question words. Okay. Um, could you just quickly read the question words for me that we talked about? What, where, who, when. Good job reading, Molly. Also, last week we talked about emotions and feelings. Okay. So let's look at this chart that I made for you, Molly, and I'll move your plan over. How about you read this for me? What does that say? Adding. Addition. Close, Molly. I like how you corrected yourself that second time. You're right. Add it on. Addition. Addition. Would you like to try and read that sentence for me? Pulling two or more things together. Great. I love how clearly you read that. Component four. Provide a range of examples and non-examples to highlight content being taught. Another critical aspect of explicit instruction to accompany the previous three components is for teachers to provide a range of examples and non-examples for new content being taught. Examples should be clear 
and provide deep insight into the meaning of the content. Non-examples, when used, should draw a crystal clear contrast that does not inadvertently introduce confusion. In the following clip, note how Ms. Hutchins is explicitly teaching using examples and non-examples. Also, within the same lesson, she is modeling and providing lots of opportunities for students to respond. Playing cards are really good examples of point symmetry. Let me show you one that is a perfect example, and then we can look at ones that are, or you can tell me ones that are not examples. This is an example of a playing card that does have point symmetry. It does have point symmetry because if you pick it up and turn it upside down, it looks exactly the same. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this jack looks exactly the same upside down as it does right side up. Now let me tell you something that's commonly confused with point symmetry. Some people want to say if you flip it or reflect it down, if it looks the same. That's not how it works. You have to be able to turn it upside down, not flip it. So let me show you some more and you can tell me if they have point symmetry. What about this four of hearts? Yes. Does it look exactly the same when I turn it upside down? Yes. It absolutely does. It has point symmetry. What about this guy right here, the eight of clubs? I call it puppy no. feet. No. no. Why does this one not work? Right. These two right here, when you flip it around, they don't look exactly the same. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so let's look at another one. In summary, Explicit instruction is effective for many students, not only those with disabilities. This approach can be used across grade levels and content areas. Although explicit instruction can be provided by any teacher, the unique setting and needs of students being taught determines the level of intensity with which the teacher uses this practice. The difference in intensity is not merely the number of students in each class but that instruction should be appropriately intense, matched to the unique needs of students. A trained special educator or similar specialist is responsible for ensuring data that is carefully collected and monitored drives instructional decision making. This ensures the explicit instruction being delivered is appropriately intense and the team is ready to make changes as needed. More information about increasing the intensity of explicit instruction to meet the unique needs of students spread across various instructional settings can be found at highleveragepractices.org and the National Center for Intensive Intervention website. Thanks for watching, and please look for other videos in this series on high leverage practices.